Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday to you all. As we get ready to start service this week, I want to talk about this upcoming week of Holy Week, and we have several different things that we're going to be doing. So the first thing is this Thursday is going to be the Seder dinner that we've been talking about, and that is at 6 o'clock here at the church, and we will be remembering Passover, and we will be sharing in communion, and just really um, putting us into the frame of mind as we go into Good Friday and the rest of Holy Weekend. And then next Sunday is our Easter service, which we are very excited for. We do have some people that will be getting baptized. So if you've never been a part of that, that's something that's really important to our church on Resurrection Sunday that we share in the people who have made that commitment to the Lord. And it's just, it's a beautiful celebration that we do next Sunday. So we invite you all to that as well. Today is Palm Sunday. And so in the back, you will be getting one of your palms and I never really understood why we got these. I remember as a little kid getting them and hitting my siblings, or as Evan pointed out, you can make the cool like headband that we do, or there's always somebody that can figure out how to make them into a cross. But I thought it was really interesting that they give us these things. Um, and I remember being marched around a church and trying to hype us all up, and I, I didn't really get it. But it's one of the few symbols of the church that we still continue to this day. And when I was thinking about it today, it's really a symbol of the excitement, of the excitement of Jesus coming into Jerusalem and the Jews and the people and the disciples who had started to follow him were so excited because they're like, this is the person who's going to fix all of this for us. This is the person who's going to solve all of our problems, who's going to get rid of the Romans, who's going to come in and be a king. And they were so excited that they, I think that they just started ripping things off the side of the road and throw it in because this is not exactly what I would present to a king if I knew he was coming. And so I think about what in our lives, you know, cultivates that level of excitement and for me, the only thing I could think about was when I made the decision to follow Christ. And so that really put a, a twist on this Holy Week because they came in to Palm Sunday with that same excitement that Jesus was going to save them. And he did, but he did it in a completely different way than they expected. And so they experienced the let down the heartache, the forgottenness of, of Good Friday and, and throughout the weekend. But we can look at this, and we know the other side of the story. And so today, as we're looking at Palm Sunday, I want you to think about when you made that decision to the Lord, when he filled you with that excitement, when he renewed your energy, because that is the level of excitement that we are celebrating today, that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, where Jesus was coming to save his people, just in a way they didn't know how yet. So I'm going to read from the Gospel of Matthew this morning. And as we remember, it says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them in to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken to the prophets. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very loud crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the roads. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, save us, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Lord God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for this opportunity to remember that excitement, to remember the joy and the faith and the hope that people had placed in you of you coming in. And Lord God, we know the end of the story. We know what next Sunday will bring. And so today, God, we celebrate that excitement that you have come to save us, that you have come to rescue us from our sins, that you have come to restore the relationship between us and the Father. And so, God, today, as we celebrate this Palm Sunday, I pray that we are reminded of that, that we are excited about that, and that as we look at your symbols that you have given us, 
that we would remember our relationship with you. I ask that your spirit now would be present in this place, and I ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Well, let's stand up this morning. Let's sing and rejoice, and let's raise an alleluia to our King. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. In death is defeated, the King is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah, I will watch the darkness flee, I raise a hallelujah, in the middle of the mystery, I raise a hallelujah. You lost your hold on me And I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Hope will arise In death is defeat Sing a little louder Sing a little louder In the presence of my enemies Sing a little louder Louder than the unbelief Sing a little louder My weapon is a melody oh, Sing a little louder Heaven comes to fight for me in the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief, sing a little louder, my weapon is a melody, oh, sing a little louder, heaven comes to fight for me, sing a little louder, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes, hope will arise In death is defeated, the King is alive I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm Hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. 
Blessed assurance and Jesus is mine He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood and what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. My Savior, the one who will never fail, He will never fail. In perfect submission, all is at rest. Author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story. And this is my song. And praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. As I trust in my Savior, the one who will never fail, He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one. never fail and I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered, I sought the Lord. And he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord. And he heard, and he answered, that's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord. And he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord. And he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord. And he heard, and he answered, that's why I trust him, that's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, that's why I trust him, that's why I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail, He will never fail, cause I trust in God, my Savior, the one. And I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord. 
any hurt, any answer, I sought the Lord. Any hurt, any answer, I sought the Lord. Any hurt, any answer, that's why I trust Him. That's why I trust in God. trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Yes, I trust in God, my Savior, the one could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs you get up and praise the Lord so come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song 
Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord So come on my soul Oh don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord So come on my soul Oh don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah and I know it's not much but I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah worship today? Yes, yes. We get to experience that worship because of what happened, right? Because of what we're about to celebrate this week, because Christ died on the cross for us so that we could experience him, so we could spend eternity with him, and we could experience this heart of worship as the Spirit comes in our sanctuary this morning and, and, and fills us. But in, in, in chapter Luke, in Luke chapter 19, I think in verse 41, as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and looking over the city, it says that he wept. And he didn't weep because he was, he didn't weep for himself because he knew it was going to happen. He was weeping for the people of Israel who were going to reject him. And knowing that as a result of that rejection, they were going to suffer and they did. But we don't have to experience that because we know him, right? And we accepted him as our savior. But what about the people that are outside these doors? We should be weeping for them. We should be weeping for those that are rejecting him and don't have the experience that we have to come in here and wholeheartedly with our spirit worship the king. So I ask you this week that as we celebrate Holy Week and we get ready for the resurrection, 
that we, we look for opportunities perhaps to share this with other people so that they could also experience this heart of worship that we experience because we know Christ is our King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, God. I thank you for this time that we're able to come and worship you for who you are, Lord. And I thank you, God. <clears throat> I thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit among this congregation this morning. I know it isn't much. It isn't much, God, but it's all we have. And we give it to you wholeheartedly, everything this morning, God. Our praise and worship, our study of your word, God, our fellowship, our prayers, Lord, everything we give to you this morning, God. We thank you, God, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us so that we can live in eternity with you, Lord. But I pray, God, that you would give us what we need through your spirit, Lord. Through your spirit, Lord, to tell others so that we just don't put all this in our pocket and walk out and keep it to ourselves, God. I pray that you would give us what we need, the boldness to go out and tell others, Lord, this is a great opportunity. People are talking about Easter, whether they know anything about it, Lord. So I pray that we would take this opportunity when people are talking about Easter to explain to them what it really is, Lord. We pray, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. The last three weeks, we've been talking about what happened really from today to next Sunday. We look at it through this, the lens of what the people, as Jesus came into this high point today, and then the crucifixion. We talked about the denial of Christ. We talked about discounting Jesus as the Messiah. And we talked about the people in the city of Jerusalem, the disciples, the desertion of him in those last days. Jesus came for change. And all of us struggle with change in our lives. We get comfortable with the status quo. But we must understand and we must expect that Jesus came for change. And the question is, will we accept this change that Jesus is bringing to our lives? And I would say the denial and the, and the um, deserting of Christ and discounting him and the Messiah all had to do was when they were told of this change, when he said this to them, whether it was individually, whether it was in a group, it caused these three things to happen. 20 years ago, I was hired to manage an apartment building in Utica, New York. It was the largest apartment building that was ever built in upstate New York. It was seven stories high and it was a block long. When I got there, there were many vacancies. The collections were extremely low and the place was in need of repair. When I think back to the first day I arrived at the property, I remember the staff meeting them. They were a little sheepish. They were not overly friendly to me. And they guarded the information that I asked from them. They knew something was going to change by me coming. And as a new manager, there had to be change. And even though the property was perform performing below standards, they didn't want change. They feared change and didn't want to lose their power or their position or what they occupied in that building. The way they did things, they believed, even though it was not profiting or it was not beneficial to the tenants, they believed in it. I was not liked by many of them, but I was not hired to be liked. I was hired for change. 
That change brought about a better, a better property financially, a better place to live for the tenants, and there had to be change in order for that to happen. You see, change brings about new outcomes, but it costs us the status quo. Change brings about new outcomes, but it always costs us the status quo. See, there has to be a change in order for a new outcome to happen. So I'd like to look at some changes that Jesus brought. Jesus entering Jerusalem on this historic day was about change. Jerusalem represented the religion, right? The culture of the Jews, the power center of the nation. It had the temple that was built for worship, built for sacrifice, built to God. It was where you came and paid the temple tax. It was the focal point of the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus came for the purpose of change. And let's look at a few of these changes. The first change we find is in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 through 19. If you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 20, we'll look at a few in Matthew chapter 20 and Matthew 21. Now, as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles, be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he'll be raised to life. On the third day, the Son of Man will be raised to life. Well, we could say that this is new, but Jesus had a miracle not too many weeks before this to Lazarus and bring him to life. So it's not the first time that we see death to life. But it's the first time that we know now it's going to be about Jesus. On the third day, the Son of Man will be raised. And so one change that Jesus has come to bring all of us is this idea of death. The finality of it is changed now to a life. And we can look at it from a spiritual concept of the abundance of life that Christ can have or the death of life that you would feel and of, with anxiety and fear and all these type of things. We can look at it through the lens of life ending here, but him providing eternal life later. But Jesus brought this change to us. <clears throat> the second change we see is in the following verses. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it that you want, he said. She said, grant me the one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at the left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from the, my cup. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those from whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The second change we see in these verses is that we see the idea of being great moving into the concept of being a servant. Now, I don't know if any of us wake up in the morning saying that I am the greatest. But I know we certainly wake up in the morning and the first person we see and we find out that we certainly don't want to be the servant all of our lives. 
Jesus goes on and he says, if you want, from the first to the idea of slave. And none of us wants to be a slave. None of us wants to be told what to do. From being served to being the one that serves. We struggle with that concept too. Jesus said this, that his life was a ransom for many. So that is a change too, to, to think that here he has the ability to live his life, to continue on and till death takes him out normally. But he says, you know what, I've changed that, given up my life for the ransom for others' benefit. Jesus came to change the prideful to become humble. The greatest, the first, the served, all will be asked to change something more productive in their lives for others. Life, Jesus asked for, would be about giving to others so that they may have life by what we have been given. In Matthew 21, verse 12, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those who sell any doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called the house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. The temple will no longer be a place of taking advantage of people for money. That's what was happening in Jesus' time. But the change will be to a house of prayer. Jesus came to change the purpose of what the temple at that time was, a form of business, to become a temple of a sanctuary, a place to worship and a place where people could have a relationship with God. The next morning, in verse 18... of chapter 21, tells us that Jesus was on his way back to the city and he was hungry. Verse 19, seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it but found nothing on it except for leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. Jesus came to change an expectation from no fruit to fruitfulness. And this took place as he was entering Jerusalem. It was time for there to be fruit on this fig tree. It was time for the Jewish people to by now be showing fruit of the relationship and their chosen people by God. And so as Jesus looked at the tree and and saw no fruit there, he cursed it and said, you'll no longer be. And whether you want to look at it as foreshadowing, but it's certainly the truth as he said this to the Jewish people. You have know what I've expected from you, but yet there has been no change. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 and 42. As he approached Jerusalem... He saw the city and he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus came to change conflict. All the things that we feel inside of ourselves to peace with him. Jesus came to change chaos to order. Jesus came to change condemnation to salvation. What they thought would bring them peace. What an incredibly open statement. What we thought would bring us peace only led to destruction. However amazing this peace would be for them, they didn't want change in their lives and because they would not change. 
the way to peace was hidden from them. So let's recount the changes that Jesus wanted to bring. He wanted to bring death to life. He wanted them to understand that the greatest had to become the servant. He wanted them to understand that they are not to be served, but they are to be serving. He wanted to change the idea of religion, the idea of tradition, the idea of culture, to a relationship. He wanted to bring fruitfulness and change it to fruitful. He wanted to bring conflict to peace. All these can be seen in Jesus not just as a prophet or a great teacher or a miracle worker, but the biggest change for them they were not able to work out was Jesus, the person of the Messiah. The problem was the people of Jerusalem were content in their ways. And Jesus spoke to this very issue. And Jesus said to them, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We can look at that verse at the end of it and just change the wording a little bit to help us to broaden this understanding. Because Jesus is the way and Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life. If, if that is true, no one comes to the Father except through the changes that he produces in us. So many live their lives in death around us and not in abundance because they won't accept change. Eternal life was certainly offered Abundant life was offered, but death was chosen because change was fought against. So many lived their lives in pursuit of greatness, of being first, or wanting to be served, but the thought of change to something different is dismissed as foolishness. You see, it's in the defeat of pride that humbleness finds its power. It's in humbleness that we see our true selves and we see our true need for Christ in our lives to make those changes. So many practice religion and miss the relationship part with God. It's not how we worship. It's not how we pray. And truly, it's not how we live. It's why we worship. It's why we pray. And it's why we live. So many live a life of fruitfulness with leaves of full green about them, but no fruit to share, no seeds to be sown, and no trees to be planted. It's not the size of the tree. It's the fruit upon it, which is what is important. So many live their lives knowing that Jesus and knowing of him from the historical point of view, but fail to understand that he is the Messiah, the Savior. And we struggle with faith in the person of Jesus being the deity of God. Jesus came to, to change. And when he came to Jerusalem, to its people, a much needed change from their ways that they lived. History tells us of their choice. Jerusalem was destroyed as Jesus told them it would be. The Jews were scattered to cities all around the known world. Jerusalem itself fell into rumble for thousands of years. And it seems like by the time of a Friday night that they made their choice and history started to direct the choices and, and, and they started living out 
what Jesus said would happen to them. It seems like almost the story is done. They missed it. They made a mistake. And yet, how many of them really realized it? But yet, there's still hope. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem was not the entrance of a king. How could it be? Riding on a donkey, riding on a foal, with cloaks being taken off by some and and branches taken off by others. And it seems to be a foreshadowing of a different type of servant coming in that way. The triumph of in Jerusalem was the triumph over humility, over pride, life over death, righteousness over evil, peace over chaos, fruitlessness over fruitful to fruitful. And now, looking back 2,000 years later, Christians celebrate this day as a change that would affect all of history. This day is the first day of the week of events that Jesus lived into his words of change. He not only stated them to the disciples, he not only said it to the Pharisees, he not only spoke to the high priest, but he lived out what he expected of them. Jesus would demonstrate in the next days of history the changes that he wanted to bring to all people. The reason? To give life to the fullest. To reestablish relationships. To give life. And now as we sit here, we have to understand that these changes are for us too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him will have eternal life. But I think about that because, again, here's this idea of belief. And what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? Does that mean we're confronted now with what he's asking of us? Does it mean now that we have to believe in the changes that he wants to make into us? Does believing in him more than just seeing him as a historical figure or or knowing that he lived? But is belief and trust in him letting him do the changes in our lives that have to come for us to have life in the way that he has designed us to? Just as the people of Jerusalem were told of the changes Jesus wanted to make, so we have the Gospels that now have made known to us, in Jesus' own words, as we read them, the changes that he wants to make in our lives. We'll not only accept Jesus as the Messiah, but also accept the changes that he'll bring to us. You see... For some of the disciples, it was the changes that brought about denial. It was the changes that brought about the disconnecting that he had with them. It was the changes that brought about the deserting of Christ. And it's the same changes that produce in us a response. And I know over the last three weeks that we've wrestled with this. Why is it that we deny Christ? Why is it that we discount him from being the Messiah that he is? Why is it that we desert him? And truly, if you look at it, it's because of the changes that he wants to bring. I don't know what it takes for human beings to understand because it's faith that Jesus wants so much more for us than what we're willing to accept from him.
He's asking us to have a life full of fruitfulness. And yet some of us are content to be fruitless, to look like Christians, but yet not producing the fruit of a Christian. Some of us just struggle with pride, especially to those that we see less than ourselves. And Jesus is calling us to become humble. Some of us love the idea of religion, the idea of order, the idea of coming in and, and knowing what's going to happen. But Jesus is pushing that to the idea of a relationship, an idea of conversation. We struggle with wanting to be the master of our own life. But he's asking us to change that, to become servants, to become purposeful in his kingdom. He's asking us to reach out to people who are doomed to death and extend life through Jesus Christ to them. It was on this day that I just can imagine the excitement. As people heard the disciples singing as Jesus was walking into Jerusalem. Because we know that the Pharisees were upset about this and asked him to say, look, rebuke, rebuke them. They shouldn't be singing Hosanna. God save us. And Jesus said to them, if I stop them, then the rocks are going to cry out the same thing. I don't know how much excitement it was, and I don't know what they thought they were doing as they pulled their coats off, and, and, and they were accepting of something as him as a king. And history tells us that they were hoping probably to overthrow Rome and that Jesus was going to set up a, a new kingdom and, and the disciples were going to be a part of that. And, and boy, and this week really just shook all the things that they thought and Jesus started talking about humility and service and love and compassion. And he looked over the city and he, he wept over it because they didn't get it. They missed it. And man, the biggest thing would be for us to miss it. The biggest thing for us would be to, to say, I'm happy with my religion. I'm happy with my tradition. I'm happy with my culture. I'm happy being prideful. I'm happy being a master. As we go up against the collision of those changes, we're pushed into denial. We're pushed into deserting. We're pushed into discontent with him. And what makes this week so powerful is when we start understanding what it's all about. And so I wouldn't want to teach any of our kids to, to be excited about the palm. I'd want to teach our kids to be excited about laying down the palm and what it truly means. And so how we'll end this is very simple. You've been given a palm that represents the branches, that represents the cloaks, that the, the things that they put down on the ground for the, the king to enter in as a king would. But for each one of us, it's our acceptance of who he is and what he's come for. Change. And when we know the change that he wants from us, when we take the palm and we lay it down, we're saying, we'll accept what you're asking of us. That changes this whole week. And it certainly changes Easter. Because then we celebrate the resurrection, the power over everything that God has given his son. The power over pride, the power over us being our own master, the power of us first, and changes us into loving people that know how to love their brother and sister as we love ourselves. Symbolic, the palm symbolic the laying down of it. 
I'll leave that with you and how you'll do that today in whatever way that is. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you on this day that history, history tells us of your entering into Jerusalem. And Lord, the commotion and the noise and the excitement, who is this? This is Jesus of Nazareth. This is the great prophet. This is the great teacher. And Lord, people started yelling, Hosanna, save us. For they truly wanted to be saved from what they were experiencing. And Lord, as you brought the reality of what it would take and the changes in their life to, to, to have to be saved, Lord, that's when things started to change. And Lord, as we've looked at that in the last three weeks and we've Think about these changes that you're asking for each one of us today. Real, realize that these are hard changes that you're asking of us. But Lord, without change, the outcome isn't any different. And so Lord, I just pray that you would help us. Give us the ability to see clearly. Give us the ability to have wisdom. And Lord, give us the ability to choose that you can be our king. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Stand together. And how deep the Father's love for us. And how vast beyond all measure. And that He should give His only Son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away his wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished It is finished No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give it.
Jesus that paid my ransom. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and goodness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Amen.